I am really excited to be here today and to be talking with this group and uh, and especially it's always great to connect with Ella. Ella is one of my my favorite people. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about my story. I'm going to talk a little bit about podcasting as a thing, what it is and why it matters. I'm going to share some of the lessons from my own stroke and uh, a little bit about achieving goals. And then we've got uh, I've got just a couple of one-handed techniques that I find are helpful, including we're even going to talk about the banana. So uh, we've got uh, got a few things a few things there uh, going on, and let me just uh, da, 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 just taking a quick look at making sure I got my features set up. Okay, so my story. Uh, or, or why I'm part of this community now, began on June 3rd, 2017. It was a Saturday morning, and I woke up at about 7.15 uh, to use the bathroom. And right away, if I am up at 7.15 on a Saturday morning, you know that things have gone terribly wrong. Um, what uh, I found was that I basically woke up and my left arm felt a little weird. I figured I had just sort of slept on it wrong and hurt myself while I slept because I was in my mid 40s. And apparently that's a thing that happens when you're in your 40s. You start hurting yourself while you sleep. So um, I figured it's just going to wake up and come back online uh, in a few moments. Uh, spoiler alert, it didn't. I uh, made my way to the bathroom and my left leg started to go offline as well and I was having trouble standing and balancing. And then I caught myself in the mirror and saw that the left side of my face was not where it was supposed to be. Uh, at that point, I'm thinking something's wrong. Maybe I should, uh, should go just sort of go back to bed and take a nap. Fortunately, there was a voice in the back of my head uh, reminding me about a viral video I had seen about 10 years earlier of a woman at a of a reporter at an awards show she was outside and she suddenly started speaking gibberish and then fell down and all the commentary at the time was that uh, oh wow she had a stroke so my brain was screaming this could be a stroke and you need to take a take care of this um later on i did some further research and and she says she didn't have a stroke she actually had a migraine but the point is, I, I realized this was something I needed to take care of. So I um, made my way back to the bedroom. I woke up my girlfriend and told her, I think I need an ambulance. She got on 911, made the call and got the, uh, got the ambulance there. Um, there's the uh, dispatch from the Seattle Fire Department, ambulance A25 came and picked me up. They spent a, a few minutes with me there. Somehow or other, they managed to get the stretcher into the elevator, and I'm still not convinced it actually fits in there, but they got it in there. They got me down to the ambulance parked outside, asked me what hospital I wanted to go to, and I'm thinking two things now. First of all, if this is a stroke and my brain is dying why am I the one being asked to make life-changing decisions right now? I'm probably not the best one for that. But what I ended up saying was, because there were three hospitals within very close proximity to where I was, I just said Swedish because my girlfriend had had surgery there a few years earlier and hadn't died. So I was thinking that's, that's good enough for me. So we made our way, lights and sirens, to Swedish, we paused briefly when they took me out of the ambulance. Uh, at some, put some, so somebody put a bracelet on me and uh, without even, even realizing it, I suddenly had three IVs in me in various places, wheeled me straight into CT and did the CT scan. And that was one of those things where, as I'm going through this whole thing, I'm just processing all this and just trying to figure out what's going on. And that was where I learned some very interesting trivia. Like I had no idea how fast blood flows in the human body. Uh, 
and they put me in the CT and then they're like, okay, now we're going to turn on the contrast fluid. So this might get a little bit warm. So then I felt this warm fluid flow into my elbow. And then before I knew it, it was in my toes and in every other part of my body. And it's just amazing how quickly this stuff flows through your body as you're going through this. I'm, I'm sure many of you, if you were conscious at the time, can, can relate to that experience. But uh, after that, they wheeled me back into an emergency room and started doing the other tests, including this one. Uh, I don't know if you see, get to see this same image in the Canadian healthcare system, but this is one of the standard stroke assessment tests they give you in, in the US hospitals where the doctors show you this picture and ask you what is happening in this picture. I guess they're assessing your awareness, they're assessing your language, they're assessing other stuff. I just said 1957. And the doctor just sort of looked at me, looked at the picture and then went, good enough. They had the ultrasound tech come in uh, where they did the ultrasound of my heart. They found I did have a small PFO. Uh, she did a bubble test. So she actually injected air into my IV at which point I was like, you know, I've seen a lot of procedurals and spy shows on TV. And usually this is how they kill somebody in the hospital. They just fill their IV with air. And she was like, yeah, I know they do it wrong all the time. If you really want to kill somebody, you have to inject the entire syringe of air, not just a couple of bottle bubbles. So I was thinking, oh, okay, that is good to know. Uh, so there's uh, some further trivia for the future. Next up was the wheeling into the MRI. And an MRI machine, uh, as I'm sure you can relate, was just this horribly claustrophobic, loudly clanking machine making buzzes and clanks and bangs. And there is no reason any multi-million dollar piece of precision high-tech equipment like that should make those sounds, but it does. Uh, and that's where they finally confirmed the stroke. An ischemic stroke in my right middle cerebral artery that starved off my basal ganglia. So four and a half years ago is when I broke my basal ganglia. And it's amazing how it's just such a very small spot that cuts off that circulation that then has such incredibly life-changing properties about it. Uh, so we're going through, so I'm going through that. I spent the rest of the day in the emergency room there. Uh, and one of the things that was really interesting to learn was that, of course, the stroke didn't all happen at once. It took me, it, this was that symptoms started showing up at about 7.15, and it wasn't until three o'clock that afternoon that I had finally lost all control of my left side limbs. Um, so that was also a very interesting thing to learn. Because I was a wake up stroke in 2017, my last known good had been at 1.30 in the morning. And so I was outside the TPA window. And at that point I was outside the thrombectomy window. Uh, and so there was nothing they could do except just sort of make sure things didn't get worse. I spent the next month in the hospital with highlight being spending the afternoons, an hour or two a day, just sitting down outside the parking lot my girlfriend would wheel me down in my wheelchair and we would stop at Starbucks and get coffee and then just sort of sit out there and chat and make snarky comments and uh, uh, try to catch Pokemon and just sort of watch cars come by. And it was just such a pleasant break from the day in order to be able to do that uh, and just have that little bit of normalcy uh, in those just very strange days for me. Uh, and of course they spell our names wrong. So I was always wondering if I could use uh, our Starbucks cups with our misspelled names to get uh, fake passports if ever needed. Uh, but yes, my girlfriend was a delight and she made uh, a big difference for me in the time that I was there, even when she was stealing all of my pillows in the bed. Uh, and eating some of the saddest pizza to come out of the hospital cafeteria. I mean, she really sacrificed and, uh, and stepped up uh, for me as needed. 
So it was a month there doing PT and OT. I was left with left side hemiparesis. Uh, I managed to avoid uh, cognitive deficits, had some speech uh, slurring for the next few months, although most people thought it was gone within the next couple of weeks. Um, I could still hear it. Uh, today, I have I can walk around with a cane and an AFO. I'm starting to get some independent finger control back. Uh, so, and, and, and then I still contend with some of the neuro fatigue. Uh, and of course, there is about a one centimeter length of my upper lip that has absolutely no feeling. And aside from that, I, I've been lucky to get my sensation back. But we can look at what caused my stroke. Uh, one possibility is, of course, this sandwich I had a few days earlier. That is a deep fried peanut butter and jelly. It was probably not that sandwich in particular, but uh, uh, a, a lifestyle of eating a bunch of sandwiches like that. Doctor Who fans may recall this first Doctor story called The Gunfighters. It is the absolute worst Doctor Who story I have ever seen. Uh, and it was just painful to watch. And I watched that the night before the stroke. So it's entirely possible that it was this episode of Doctor Who that, that had a large part to do with my stroke. But what's more likely is that a couple of years before, I had about a year, year and a half of high blood pressure. The only reason I found out I had high blood pressure was that during the Christmas holidays one year, I started having nosebleeds every other day that would last for 30 minutes. Uh, I checked my blood pressure and it came out at 200 over 160. When you make an appointment with your doctor and tell them your blood pressure is 200 over 160, they book you in on that appointment very quickly. So I was able to get, uh, to get in there uh, and, uh, and get that treated. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done. So even though my blood pressure was under control uh, by six months before my stroke, it had already damaged the arteries enough that that clot was able to form in place. So watch that blood pressure. It is, uh, it, it, it'll get you. Uh, so beyond that, let's talk now a little bit about podcasts. Uh, if you don't listen to podcasts, let's start with what is a podcast. It is basically, it's a combination of internet radio meeting the VCR. Uh, it's audio broadcasts that you can listen to for free. You can subscribe to them for free so that they just come down to your mobile device whenever a new one comes out. You can listen whenever you want. So you can listen when you're doing your PT or your OT exercises, when you're doing the dishes, when you're driving someplace or riding the bus or whatever. It's all about listening wherever you want, on your smartphone, on your computer, on a device like an uh, Amazon Echo device or a Google Assistant device, on Pandora, on Spotify, on whatever. And there are hundreds of thousands of active podcasts out there. There are millions that you can listen to, and there are about 300,000 that are being updated every month on just a huge array of topics. Even just within the health category, you're going to find hundreds of them, or, or thousands, tens of thousands, really. They are a thing, and people enjoy listening to them because, well, they're free, there's no gatekeeper, meaning that anybody can go ahead and start a podcast. Uh, you can, uh, you want to start your own, you absolutely can tonight if you wanted to. There's nobody to tell you not to. There's also a very intimate connection when you're listening to podcasts, because unlike when you're watching TV across the room or something like that, most people are listening to podcasts with headphones or with earbuds. So the person you're listening to or the people you're listening to are talking directly into your ears. So you can be there doing the dishes, doing your exercise, while in your ears, you're hearing directly my voice and Ella's voice as we, we share stories. Uh, it's an opportunity to hear other people's stories and to just connect with others within our community and within different communities and to learn different things. And it's nice to just be able to listen. What I think drives podcasts and social media overall, and that becomes especially powerful, it drives support groups like this, 
and other uh, stroke and brain injury community groups is that ultimately people want to be seen and people want to be heard. We want to share our stories somehow, even if we don't aren't comfortable speaking in front of a group or in front of a microphone, we still ultimately want to be acknowledged and, and not ignored. Uh, if you're familiar with the Twilight Zone series that aired in the 80s, uh, I believe probably before the time for many of you folks. And honestly, I get, I'm imagine it probably got, got uh, some airplay in Canada, but I honestly can't be sure about that. But they had an episode where in a dystopian society, one of the punishments was invisibility. And somebody committed a crime and they were sentenced to a year of invisibility. So that meant they got this mark implanted in their head. And that meant that everybody else in the society had to ignore them, had to pretend they weren't there. And we got to see him go through his year of starting with thinking, oh, this won't be so bad, to a few months in, he was really feeling the pain of just being ignored. Finally, after his year is up, he got it removed and just so utterly grateful to be seen again. And then a couple months after that, he encountered someone else who had the same punishment and she had that mark on her forehead and the law required him to ignore her. And he just refused. He could not ignore somebody going through that pain. There was just something so fundamental to be, to wanting to be seen, to be heard, to being that, to being validated, to having our existence supported. And that is one of those things that's really valuable and that becomes so much harder after a stroke, whether we're locked inside due to disabilities, whether aphasia is impacting our ability to communicate what we want to say or other cognitive challenges are impacting that. Ultimately, we want to be seen and we want to be heard. When I started looking, when I had my stroke in 2017 and started looking for podcasts about stroke, there were only two I found. One came out of Australia, uh, Enable Me, and the other is all about aphasia. It's called The Slow Road to Better, which is a fantastic name for stroke recovery. Uh, now, or a couple of years ago, there are just so many more that have popped up. That is, other people have gone ahead and launched their shows. And you can find a list by just searching for them, or you can find a list over at strokecast.com, where I have a list of a bunch of other podcasts that are out there, including, of course, Strokecast. So I want to just share a few lessons I have learned from stroke now. First of all, I'm sorry to say this, but pornography has lied to all of us. There is nothing sexy about a hospital sponge bath. You know, all of a sudden those nurses were on me and I'm like, oh, 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 so this is happening now. Uh, so that, that is something you learn very quickly. Uh, strangers will surprise you. Uh, when I started walking around my neighborhood a couple months after my stroke, my arm was in a sling to prevent subluxation. I was walking with a cane. I was walking with my leg brace. I was walking very slowly and more vulnerable than at any point in my life, knowing that if something goes wrong, I cannot run away. It's just not a skill that I any longer had. I, and so you get worried when you see uh, folks around, like you know some of the homeless, where maybe is this a safe place for me to be? And uh, it was always sort of dodgy in the past. But what I found was that the people that you thought would be a threat were actually some of the kindest and friendliest. And Suddenly, uh, I'm in a in a weaker position, and I get some you get positive acknowledgement of people sympathetic and willing to help. And of course, there was one guy on the street who was uh, calling out to everybody who passed. Hey, can you give me a quarter? Hey, can you give me a quarter? Hey, can you give me a quarter? As soon as I walked past, he goes, Hey, can you give me a dime? So I guess I was getting the handicap discount as well. Another key lesson from stroke is that you're not supposed to wake up groggy. I did not know this. For decades, I would go to sleep at night, wake up in the morning, and still just feel foggy and groggy and sleepy. Uh, it turns out uh, that I had a snoring thing, which I didn't know because, well, I slept through it. Uh, my girlfriend knew. Uh, but what I found through the hospital and some of the tests they were doing they got me into a sleep 
clinic and they discovered I have sleep apnea, which means I stop breathing while I sleep. Normally, uh, sleep apnea is considered diagnosed if you stop breathing five times in an hour as you sleep. It, uh, it's considered severe if it happens 25 times an hour. I had it happening 57 times an hour. So roughly every minute, I was not breathing and I would wake up slightly, just enough for my body to start breathing again. And then I would go back to sleep and then we would go ahead and repeat this entire cycle again. So for the better part of 20 or 30 years, I was probably sleep deprived, which leads to high blood pressure, which again, leads to stroke. Disability and disability aids are not binary. By that, I mean, a lot of people think, well, I need a cane or I don't need a cane. I need a wheelchair or I don't need a wheelchair. And that's not the case. Sometimes I'll use my cane and sometimes I won't. That doesn't, just because I can walk without my cane doesn't mean I don't need a cane. It doesn't mean I'm faking it if I do use a cane or a mobility aid. And a lot of people think it's a one or the other type of thing, and it's not. I get around my apartment just fine without my cane, but if I'm going outside, I am going to use it because if I don't use my cane, it comes with a 2x spoon penalty, meaning that I will spend a lot more energy and move a lot more slowly to try and be safer, and it's just not worth it. It means I end up doing, having to do less later on in, in the day, but it's not a binary type of thing. Just like with my glasses, if I take off my glasses, the world doesn't go black around me. I can still see, just not as well. That doesn't mean I don't need glasses. It just means that glasses and you know what, how much I need them and how much I use them will vary. Same thing with other disability and mobility aids. Attitude is so important in recovery. I'm sure we've talked about this and you've encountered this. Positive attitude is great, but it's not enough. An attitude is a necessary condition for recovery, but it is not a sufficient condition for recovery. You can have the most positive attitude in the world, but if you don't do the work, you're not gonna get there. You're not gonna recover. You're not going to achieve any of the goals that you want. You have to have that right attitude to be able to believe that yes, you can do it, and yes, you need to do the work in order to do it. So all of that does then come into play for making that stuff happen. The right attitude is what enables recovery, but it doesn't guarantee it. Neuroplasticity, <laughs> neuroplasticity itself is kind of like blazing a trail through the forest. Uh, we talk about what happens in a stroke is we of course lose a whole bunch of brain cells and it's like a whole bunch of roadways and pathways have just been knocked out taken over by nature and the trees and the undergrowth and the animals and whatnot. In order to get from the part of my, my brain that wants to move my hand to my hand, we need to carve a new trail through the woods. And that means we need to start working and start walking it. One person can get through and can try to get through. Maybe they'll make it all the way, maybe they won't. And then another person goes through and another and another. The more times we make that effort, the more repetitions we do of an exercise, the easier it becomes to go down that path and to build out that path. It's also, it's like learning to ride a motorcycle. Uh, I lived in Montana for college, which is of course in the Rocky, Rocky Mountains, upper, Midwest, uh, upper part of the country, very uh, rural, can be a rural part of the country. I was bored one day, so I learned to ride a motorcycle. Never rode one after that. But one of the things they taught us was that if there is an obstacle in the road, don't look at that obstacle. Because what you look at, you will hit. What you need to do is look at the path around that obstacle. And when it comes to stroke recovery, when it comes to our goals for what we want to achieve, it's important not to focus on the things that are in the way, but in the path around those things. Focus on the path to our goals, not the obstacles that are in the way, because what we focus on is what we will hit. If we focus on the obstacle, we hit the obstacle. If we focus on the path around it, we hit the path around it. That brings me to my 
favorite word in the English language. And that word is the word yet. Yet is such an important word because it really guides how I think about everything that I'm able to do. I can say things like, I can't use my left hand or I can't use my left hand yet. I can't run or I can't run yet. That is what's so powerful for anything that we can't do versus we can't do it yet. And I would urge you, if you think about things that disabilities and deficits that you have, think about it as what you can't, not what you can't do, but about what you can't do yet, because that acknowledges the reality of today and makes a plan for it to be different tomorrow. So with that in mind, where do we go from here? Uh, I'd encourage you to visit strokecast.com. At the very top of the page, there is a link to other stroke-related podcasts. You can find me on Instagram where I am bills underscore strokecast. I'd encourage you to take your blood pressure today. And of course, as always, to don't get best, get better. Because you don't have to be the best at everything. Because if you're the best, that means everybody else is worse than you. And that does not encourage teamwork. That does not encourage working together. All you have to do is just do what you can to just be a little bit better than you were yesterday, a fraction of a percent. And all those little days of getting just a tiny bit better, that adds up to a big improvement to get you to where you want to go. So I have just two more things I want to show you now, and we're going to be done with our slides. But first, I want to show you something else on the computer. Because I currently have only one function, fully functioning hand, I still type a lot. And that's why I use a feature called sticky keys. And what you're seeing, this is in Windows 11. You can search for sticky keys on your computer, whether it's a Windows, it's also available on Mac, and I can turn it on. And what happens when I turn on sticky keys is that this means that I don't have to hold down the shift key while I press another key or I don't have to hold down the control key or the command key. I can just tap that key and it stays stuck until I type what I want. So if I wanted to type a capital B, I tap shift and then tap B. If I wanted to copy something, I tap control, then I tap C. Using this feature, I am able to type at 30 words per minute with just one hand. And that makes a big difference in doing the things that I want to do. And that brings me to the one final one hand thing I'm going to show you here. And I'm hoping you can actually see this. Are you able to see me on the, in the camera? I see Ella's got her cam camera on if you're seeing me. Okay, so now this, the, the, the th theme behind the stroke cast is that it's a Gen X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience and one handed banana peeling. So this is how I peel a banana with one hand. The trick is to hold it firmly, but not too tightly, or you'll squish it. Uh, and sometimes it takes a few to get used to it. But I brace my fingers around most of the banana, and I push the stem with my thumb. And when I push the stem with my thumb, sometimes it just breaks off right there, because this one is really fresh. The other thing that'll happen is that sometimes it'll split then along the seam. And as long as I can either get the tip of the stem to break off or I can split it along the seam, then I can get a finger down in there and I can start peeling it all with one hand. So that is one of those first tips that I had for getting around with one hand and for, you know, getting a tasty snack. So with that, I realized I have probably gone a little bit over time. I apologize for that, but I will turn it back over to our hosts for the rest of our discussion and any questions. That was amazing, Bill. Wow, Lots. over time, it's fine because we appreciate, I just made a rhyme. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the, the new wrap for our group. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so, so much. I think I got goosebumps right at the end there when you were talking about not being the best, but being better. And I just like couldn't help but have a huge smile on my face. So you're wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You again, so much. again, we are recording. Um, so if you're not comfortable asking questions, um, we'll just wait till the end when we stop recording. 
Um, right now, though, we'll probably move on. Rachel, do you want to go ahead? Um, I'll let you take the reins from here. Sure. Thank you so much, Bill. That was fantastic. Um, I think what we'll do now is I'll just do my demonstration so that we can stop the recording after I finish, and then we'll open it up for discussion, Q&A, um, back to Bill, any questions about what I've shown you. So you want to set to speaker view, then you should be able to see me. Bill, I also just want to say I especially loved your analogy of trailblazing. I'm for sure going to steal that when I'm trying to uh, explain kind of the idea of all of these sometimes really tedious repetitions to my clients. Is <laughs> I love that visual of the trailblazing. So thank you for that. Sure, absolutely. That's a new one for me. It replaced uh, a discussion about uh, muddy roads and ruts that get carved into them. Okay. <laughs> okay. I like the, I like the trailblazing. Yeah. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm Rachel. I'm one of the uh, coordinators of this group and I'm also an occupational therapist. So I wanted to take some time today. I won't take too much time but just to demonstrate some adaptive kitchen equipment that I have because uh, adaptive cooking is something that I really like doing with my clients just because I love to cook. And so when I find somebody that also loves to cook, uh, that's really exciting for me that we get to work on this stuff. And I also run a group all about adaptive cooking. So that's a super fun part of my job. So, so I have all this equipment, so I thought it would be fun to show you guys and then talk about if there's anything else that people use that they want to share about, that would be fantastic. I just have a few things. And I'll start. Let me see if I can adjust my camera so you can see in front of me. Okay, so I have this cutting board. It's called a Swedish cutting board. And this is really great for one-handed cooking for a couple of reasons. It has suction cups on the bottom so that when you place it down on your surface, it's not going anywhere. Sorry, the dog's going out for a while. She's, she's getting excited, but she'll be, she'll be gone in a minute. Um, so it has suction cups so that it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, when it's stuck down on your table or your counter. And then it has these little prongs that uh, are used to stabilize. Cause when you're cooking with two hands, when you're doing meal prep, usually you're using one hand to stabilize something that you're chopping. And then you're using your dominant hand to chop it up or peel it or whatever you're doing. Um, but if you aren't able to do that, this um, just holds the item in place for you. So that's pretty cool. And I'll demonstrate it. And then it also has these uh, barriers in the corner. So to use these, um, especially like I think it's really helpful for if you're spreading something, like if I'm trying to spread butter on toast and again, I don't have one hand to hold the toast in place and the other one to spread, you just place the toast in the corner and spread in the direction of the barriers so that it's being blocked. It's not flying right off of the plate or of the cutting board. So I'm going to show you how this cucumber. I'm going to have salad with dinner. So I'm going to chop up this cucumber so you guys can see. So I'm just going to stick it right into the prongs and I'm trying to move it around. I can't even move it anywhere because it's stuck right in there. And then I have my knife and I'm just simply going to chop it up. And I can do it from seated, which if uh, energy conservation is something that you're working on. If you find that you're fatiguing easily, it's helpful to do a lot of the prep work when you're cooking from a seated position or from a uh, perched position on a stool at the counter, if that's where the space is. Um, but yeah, this cutting board is one of the pieces of equipment that I probably recommend the most. And I'll be curious, Bill, I think you said in the chat that you use a smaller version. So I'll be curious to hear if anybody, including Bill, has 
any opinions about this, if they love it, if they hate it, um, or if they haven't seen it before. And I'll show you something else for chopping. This guy is actually my favorite. I use this all the time. Oh, where to buy it? That's a really great question. So because we've got some people in the States and some people in Canada, um, I'll say you can buy this on Amazon. So that's kind of universally one place you can get it. And it's called a Swedish cutting board. Um, and there's also, there's lots of medical supply stores that you can contact as well. So where I actually got this stuff, it's called Parson ADL. ADL is the acronym for activities of daily living. And they've got a whole bunch of stuff, but you can find a lot of it on Amazon too. Some of it, like this that I'm about to show, you can get anywhere now. You can get it at a Walmart, at a Canadian Tire if you're in Canada, if you're in the States, whatever your Canadian Tire equivalent is. Um, but I use this all the time because it's like, to me, it's just super useful for getting like a really fine chop or a mince. Uh, but I also recommend this a lot to people who have weakness of one side or they have only the use of one side or even if you've got like a shoulder strain or pain. So what it is, it's these blades that come down to chop whatever's underneath them when you press the button on top. So what I'll do is I'll take some slices of cucumber and place them on the cutting board. I'm just gonna put this right on top. And then if I press down a couple of times, you get nice dice and you can keep going if you want really fine to chop. I do this all the time with garlic. If I'm using fresh garlic and I'm mincing it, it's so tedious to be chopping these tiny, tiny bits but this does an amazing job with getting just a really fine dice. This one's great because you can use it with an open palm or with a fist. You don't need any dexterity, no fine motor skills. Um, and if you find like if you're chopping something that's kind of firm and it takes more power, you might want to stand up so you can lean into it if you're experiencing some weakness. Again, I'm doing it from seated um, and if managing fatigue and energy is something that's uh, important for you, then you might want to do this seated as well. But positioning wise, it might be more comfortable for you to put it on. Yeah, Bill, as seen on TV stores, absolutely. Um, which this is one of the infomercial products. It's a ripoff of the slap chop, which there's a big controversy. The slap chop a long time ago, um, but it's birthed these knockoff and they're fantastic. Um, okay, I have a few more things. Move the stuff to the side so that I can make space in front of me. Okay, this is a one handed can opener and it's called. Xylus, you spell it Z-Y-L-I-S-S. -S. And I just got this from Amazon. I got it because I had originally purchased this one-handed can opener from Carson ADL, which is the medical supply store. And I found that it was really hard for me to use with one hand. The idea, it's like a, any other can opener, but instead of having to squeeze it shut with one hand, and twist. It has a lock in place. So you can place it on the lid, close it tight, and it locks itself. And then you just switch over to twisting. I found that this was really challenging. Like it was really hard to get a grip. If you hold it between your legs, the can stabilize it between your legs, it became a bit easier. Uh, but if that's also not something that's accessible to you, I'd recommend going with one of these, which is entirely automatic. And I'm gonna get a can and show it. I wasn't planning to cook with chickpeas, but I will tonight. This is my only can. Okay, 
So it has batteries in it. So you do have to buy the batteries separately. And I think it just takes a couple of double A's. And it has one button to start and stop. So you place it right on top, which basically fits directly so that the body of it is right on top of the can. And then you'll be able to see where the lip needs to fit in between the two plates. And then you press the start button. And you kind of guide it a little bit. Okay, then you just press the same button to stop it. And then, did I stop it too early? I stopped it too early, I'm gonna put that down. Like a little robot, and then it turns off. Put this aside. Um, I have two more things to show. So this one's a one-handed jar opener, and it's basically just this big clunky thing with three different sized holes, and then it has these little inserts that are cone-shaped, and they're this rubbery material that has a lot of traction. So with the cone and with the material, when you push something down into it, it kind of grabs it and keeps it really still. So depending on the size of your jar, you'll put it in one of the three holes. So I just have this jar. It goes in the big one, you push it down, and then you twist with one hand. And then you can pour it out. You can take a spoon to get at whatever's in the jar, but it just makes it pretty stable while you're trying to open it. And then lastly, one of my favorite things that I use all the time in the kitchen because I'm just, I am not a very strong person. So if I encounter a really tight lid, I'll use Dyson, which this is really versatile. It comes in a roll. It comes in sheets or a roll. I have it in a roll so you can just cut it to whatever size you want. Um, but it has a lot of potential uses, but the ways that I like to use it in the kitchen are again to either stabilize because it's really, really tacky. So it has a lot of traction. So if you want to, let's say like you're mixing something in a bowl and you're not able to stabilize the bowl and as you're mixing the bowl is kind of flailing around. If you put a piece of Dyson down on the table and then put the bowl on top, you'll notice it's not perfect. Like it can still go places if you're kind of aggressively mixing, but it's a lot more stable than if there's nothing there. It's just moving back and forth and here it's pretty sturdy. Um, this stuff also, even when you get it wet, it's still sticky. So another thing I'll recommend is if people are hand washing dishes with this one side, if you place this in the bottom of the sink and put the dish on top, it's not going to fly around as you're trying to clean it. Again, it's like it's not perfect, but it makes it a lot easier than if you're just kind of going at it in the sink and the dish is flying everywhere. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing is to use it to open jars or to open um, containers, any sort of tab. So if this is on pretty tight, and even if it's stabilized in here, it's still challenging to open. You just take a piece of Dyson in your hand and you place it on top and it gives you a lot of traction so that you have to use way less of your own grip strength, arm strength. But if you don't have one of these, um, I can put the jar on top of a piece of Dyson and hold a piece of Dyson. You can see it's not really working. Yeah, so you do need, I mean, the stabilization is huge. That's, I mean, in the kitchen, one of the uh, biggest barriers that I see come up with my clients for one-handed cooking is being able to keep 
a piece of equipment or a piece of food stable while you're doing something to it. So it's not kind of flying everywhere. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Does it lose tack over time? Honestly, no, not in, I mean, maybe over a long stretch of time. Like if you had the same roll of dice in for years, I won't say for sure that it won't lose tack. But my experience is no, like for months, even up to one year, I've been using the same two pieces, just the open jars. And I have clients who we get them one roll and it lasts them years and years because it really doesn't, it gets a little bit dirty because it picks up, it's sticky. So it picks up like all the crumbs and all the dirt. So sometimes you just want to wipe it off, but Wash it with soap and water. Okay, that's interesting, Bill. So you find that it gets the tack back when you wash it with soap and water. Yeah. So this stuff has so many uses, like just around the home. Like cooking is only, you're in the kitchen at least, is only one of the kind of genres of ways that you can use Dyson. Like you can use them for any household products, for opening things, for stabilizing things. Um, yeah, it's really great. And there's so many of these products around. So these are just the ones that I have that I can demonstrate. But if anybody's interested, you have questions, feel free to ask and I'll, I can give you um, a description of some other stuff that I've seen or that I've used. And if you have access to an OT, like most OTs are just banks of knowledge of all of these little pieces of equipment that are not widely used or heard of. So if there's anything small, like even if there's just one aspect of a task that's really challenging and you have access to an OT, I just recommend going asking them like, what do you know of? Or even, you know, do you have any resources where I could look through a catalog or look through um, a website and get ideas for things that could be helpful to me? So that's basically it. I'm gonna stop recording now and then we'll open it up for discussion. Just one sec, don't stop. <laughs> don't stop, okay, okay. <laughs> I was gonna say, um, because I have a question, it's for Bill, but I think it would be helpful if we got it on the recording, if people wanna listen again after. Sure. Um, but I won't ask it yet because I see Karen has her virtual hand up. Karen, if you wanna ask that question while it's still recording, you can go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, this doesn't apply to kitchens, but I was wondering if anyone had any um, guess, hacks for putting in earrings. This is, I know that's really weird, but I, I ask people because I really struggle with it. I laugh, Karen, because I've recruited my husband and my boys to put in my earrings, and you'd think that they were doing surgery. It's quite a yeah. complicated task for them. And even though I don't have feeling in the left side, I still can sometimes feel when they're not doing it right. So they need a medical degree to do that. Yes. <laughs> I don't have a That's a great question. I don't have a hack personally. If anybody does, please share. That's a really good question. Well, someone told me like those really wide... Um, like mine are like the really um, small, like silver things that are like two circle, I don't know, hoop things. I don't know. I can't describe it. But then someone said like the real, when the ones that are like a cylinder where they have a plastic backing, so they're really mm -hmm. thick. They said those help, but I haven't gotten those. But I was just curious. I would think to use the earrings with back, like the long backings that just kind of sit at the back of your ear that don't yeah. have the clasp. Like the dangly ones? The ones I'm just picturing, like they're kind of shaped like, yeah. like this. Yeah. So they just go through and they sit. I mean, I imagine you would lose them more easily if they don't have a backing. But yeah. It would just eliminate the need to be screwing in a backing or be really. I mean, it's not a big person, to... but I have like um, some nice like diamond or something that I got for my anniversary and I like can't put them in. So. And you're you're lucky. My my husband and boys won't do it. They just don't. I'm just even thinking right now. I wonder if even something like um, sticky tack, if you put that on the back, or even like 
you know how people used to take the ends of um, pencils and cut off the eraser ends for poppies? Like, I wonder if you used a big like eraser piece and use that for your backing because it's chunkier and easier to hold on to. I don't know. I'm just thinking of that now. Good idea. That's not too bad. Yeah. I no, no, I was going to say, knowing nothing about this stuff, the, <laughs> the, the, the guy in me just says two different things. One is maybe you can just get like some of those super strong magnets and attach one to the earring and the other side of uh, one on the other side of your lobe. That would probably destroy your lobes. That's probably not a, not a great idea. Uh, the other thing that I, that I, I, I might think about would be, can you use clothespins? If you can put it through the hole in your ear, secure it to the lobe with a clothespin and then put the backing on. Oh. I don't know. I thought I'd, you were making bear the clothespin with it. I thought that's not too attractive. <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. Just put a clothespin. Depends on your neighborhood. <laughs> I guess Thank something you. us in this group to invent. The first invention of life after stroke. Everyone yeah. stay tuned. I don't know, Saj. <laughs> you put it on the, in the life after stroke merch. Merch. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Thanks everyone for, for sharing all those answers. Does anybody else have a question before I ask? Uh, Heather, I see your hand. Go ahead. Um, just with that cutting board, um, my husband is quite talented and he actually just made me one of those. Oh, that's now, amazing. Yeah. Now, the only thing I did find is with the prong sticking up when you when your arm is not, you know, moving, when you don't have the muscle control, sometimes it would slide and scrape across the, the prong. So I just used a small little plastic container and set it over top for safety so that I didn't injure myself that way or accidentally, you know, f fall down on it and pierce my hand with it. And the other thing too with uh, cutting is, even though I'm a very uh, proud home cook who hates to buy anything packaged or so on and so forth, I just resigned myself for the time being to get the pre-minced garlic and the pre-minced ginger, things like that. And then one other thing um, is that despite how scary it sounds, we have to remember that um, the safe safest knife is a sharp knife. So we should not be using doll knives or we're asking for trouble when we go to push down with more pressure to try to cut through something it's apt to slip off sorry this is my family studies teacher background coming through it's apt to slip off and uh you're apt to cut yourself yeah that's I a actually really, really good safety tip um also with the prongs that's such a good point because these are really sharp so normally what I'll um what I'll advise people to do is either if they have, if you have like an apple or something to spare, and you're not using it, you're just using the cutting surface around it, just put the apple on top so that it's, there aren't any exposed prongs. Or um, you can even get at the dollar store uh, some kind of sponge or some kind of almost like a, you can get a pool noodle and cut it up, something with that texture, just to place on top of the prongs when you're not using them. Even when it's like when you're putting it away in the cupboard. And if you have any sort of impaired sensation, then it's gonna be a square styrofoam. Yeah, exactly. Something with made of styrofoam is perfect. Um, but yeah, if you have any sort of like impaired sensation, then you also just want to be extra mindful because you could cut yourself without noticing and it could get infected before you, you know, even know that you cut yourself. So if that's something that you're experiencing, it's all the more important to make sure the prongs are covered. And the knife trick or the knife tip is really important too for safety. And I, I would stay on the knot on the point about the knives is that you're right, absolutely. Sharp knives are gonna be super important. And what I have found is that my knives go duller faster after stroke because my knife technique is relying a lot more on pressing my knife down through things versus a smoother slicing motion. So uh, if you're used to sharpening your knives once every year or once every two years, it may be time to go ahead and increase the sharpening uh, cycle. Great point.
I, all around awesome points. Karen, I still, uh, I don't know if that's a virtual hand from the question. You oh, no, I, I was just going to add, um, I have someone that actually it helps me with my clicking because I, I, my, I my right hand doesn't work. And she actually suggested, I have these plastic knives. They're for kids. They're from my culinary store. But um, they actually like will cut meat and stuff. They're not so sharp that I would cut myself as far as anything, but they do help in my cutting. So that's actually what I use. And they come in three different sizes. I like, think I, I got them off Amazon, but they're like, there's, yeah, it comes in a set. So that was a huge find of mine for people who are nervous because I am extremely nervous about cutting off a finger. I've already done that <laughs> pre-stroke. So, you know. Um, I, I found that to be very helpful. And what oh, are that's great. Calls? Thanks for sharing that. Karen. Um, well, I'll, let me, I'll go grab one and I'll see. Sure. Thanks, Karen. Rachel, do you have, uh, want to add anything or? No, I'm just thinking to myself though, that I forgot to mention, I have all of this stuff in a document, including the names and the places that you can buy all of these equipment like all these pieces that I showed. So I'll put that in the Facebook group. So if you want access to that information, it will be in the Facebook. Um, these are the knives. I don't have, um, mm -hmm. I can send it to you guys, but it comes like, this is a smaller one and there's one more that's in dishwasher, but they cut really well. I'll send it to, who do I send it to, you? Yeah, Rachel? you can. Yeah, you can send it to me. You could respond to the email with the Zoom link in it. Okay. Send, that, yeah, I mean, they, they were very, they were very cheap, but they're great. I have my kids use them too. And they, I put them in the dishwasher after. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. That's I'll, great. I'll, I'll just it. drop, I was gonna say, I'll just drop a link in the chat. I have a collection of ones that are available on Amazon, a bunch of kitchen gear and other hack gear that you might find, uh, might find useful as well, including the steak knife that I use when I have with, uh, a vertical rocking knife that's all designed for one-handed use. So there's a bunch of stuff on there. Yeah, the rocking knife, I've seen a lot of people have really good uh, mm -hmm. experiences with. That's, that's great. really helpful, Bill. Thank you. I'm going to take that from you too so I can absolutely a few things from your kit. Wow, there has been so much exchange of really awesome resources. Um, so I hope everyone's, you know, checking out the chat and uh, we'll be sure to, you know, follow up on our Facebook group. And if you're not part of the Facebook group yet, um, just message in the chat right now um, and we'll try and add you or you can just search Life After Stroke support group in Facebook and uh, just request to be added as well. Um, any other questions right now before I move on to the one that I have for Bill? Uh, I'll, I'll just add my quick hack for cutting your steak when you actually go out to eat at a steak place or someplace else is to ask the server to have the kitchen cut your steak up in advance <laughs> for you. And uh, they are more than happy to do that at any decent place. And by decent, I don't mean expensive. I mean place with nice people. Mm. <laughs> Great point. Great point. And yes. Um. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and ask that burning question. Um, I, Emily, I never thought to ask the server for that. Yes, Bill. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Because honestly, I wouldn't have thought that either. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So the question I have for Bill, um, and so just for clarification, I am able to use all my extremities. I had some weakness mm -hmm. after my stroke, which was years ago. Um, but I'm able to use them both now. But the reason I thought of this question, um, Bill knows that I, I love reading about habits and I'm all about understanding habit, basal ganglia. And Bill, you mentioned that you had your stroke um, in the basal ganglia. Is that mm -hmm. my correct? So that is yeah. correct. Okay. So I am wondering, after your stroke, did you have any, um, did you notice a difference in not, uh, doing things as habitually as you were before. And I guess if you did notice those um, habits not really coming to you or not being able to carry them out, um, 
or was it frustrating if you did want to um, do a habit, but that habit was supposed to be supposed to be done with your non-affected side, but now that you have an affected side, you want to do the habit, but you can't actually use your one arm. Um, was there a barrier frustration there that you had to get over? And if so, how did you do that? Uh, I found a little bit of frustration with that. Now, uh, I've always been right-handed and heavily right, right-hand dominant, and I was left side affected. So my left already wasn't used to doing a ton of things, but I did have to, um, what I would find is that, yeah, it was more about trying to then having to do some of that problem solving. I think in my case, I didn't experience, I don't think I experienced too much frustration in and of itself where I'm more likely to encounter that now is now that I am getting better and trying more things, I'm discovering things that I can't do yet that were out of the realm of even considering a couple of years ago. So it's now that as I, as I push myself, I find some more of that stuff. Now, at the same time, in addition to being basal ganglia impacted, um, it was also right brain impacted, which has probably in some respects flattened my affect a little bit. So outside of the emotional ability and the random crying that would happen in the hospital, whenever I did physical exertion or just had the slightest trigger, which was also really interesting to just start crying when you're not sad or feeling the strong emotion. And it was just like a physiological thing that just happened uh, that really probably scared my girlfriend because I am not a crier and it would just start happening. Um, but it was very disconnected from a feeling of emotion or some feelings of frustration. Uh, I think a lot of it was just having to adapt to some of those other things. I had to replace my computer keyboard for one thing because I had an ergonomic keyboard. And those are great when you're typing with two hands. They're terrible when you're trying to type with one because you can't get over the hump as easily. So that was frustrating. But for my, in my case, a lot of it stemmed, it, it, it drove deep into problem solving. It's like, okay, this is a new thing. Now, how can I, how can I deal with this? Actually, you got me thinking about this stuff now. And so I'm going back into the archives. What was probably most frustrating for me in the hospital, first of all, hospitals, absolutely terrible place to sleep and probably the place where sleep is most important because sleep is work. Just like when they shut down the freeway at night, they don't do it to give the freeway a break. They do it because they can only do repair work when it's closed. And just like there's parts of your recovery where the brain can only do its healing when you're asleep. I've always been a left side sleeper. Uh, and when I was in the hospital, not only did I have to try to sleep on my right, try to sleep on my right side so I didn't mess with my subluxation and damage my shoulder more, but also, yeah, that's right. This is what was really frustrating about that was turning over, rolling over when you're living with hemiparesis is incredibly difficult, especially in, in the early days. And having to try to turn over to get onto my other side, I mean, it was one thing to try and roll over onto my left side because I could swing with my right and get some momentum going, but then I'm not supposed to be on my left side. Have to get over onto my right side. I had no ability to swing over that arm. Because one of the things that a lot of people forget about as well is that when you're left side affected, it's not just the arm and the leg, it's the core, it's all those muscles on that side of your body. So everything that's involved in sitting up straight to twisting, all of that goes offline as well and to try and roll over. So that was, that was a thing and you don't think about it until you try to do it. And I think that's, the way it is with a lot of these things. You don't realize it's a problem until you try to do it. 
And I remember being in the hospital and being super frustrated some nights when I realized I have to call somebody to tuck me in in the middle of the night because I can't fix my blanket. I'm 46 years old and I have to have somebody tuck me in. And that's what was just super, super frustrating. 